Hydroxyurea is relatively very well tolerated and effective first-line therapy for patients with polycythemia vera. Up to a quarter of the patients with uh, hydroxyurea therapy develop resistance or intolerance and they need something else. They need a better therapy that would control their symptoms and signs. And this is particularly important for the patients that are really resistant to hydroxyurea. They do have more aggressive disease, they have more symptoms, bigger spleen, they tend to transform more to malofibrosis and acute myeloleukemia and sh have a shorter life expectancy. There are not too many options. Interferon is one of the options, but it does not work in many patients. It does cause many side effects. Even with the advent of a new long-acting interferons, the results do not support long-term use of those medications. And other traditional medications that we have been using in this setting, alkylating agents like busulfan, melphalan, chlorambucil, aragatic phosphorus, are known to be leukomagenic meaning increasing the risk of transformation to acute myeloleukemia. So there was a clear need for a new drug that would be developed that is safe and perhaps biologically targeting what is abnormal in PV. And ruxolitinib has fulfilled that role. It is targeting hyperactive JAK-set pathway. With that, it does diminish very quickly the number of cells in blood. It does diminish very quickly the spleen that may be enlarged in these patients and what I see in my patients, I have treated many patients, quality of life markedly improves within a couple of weeks in many patients that don't have a good options. So now we have complete picture of controlling all blood cell counts, spleen and symptoms in patients with PV after hydroxyurea. This is where the real role for, hydro, for ruxolitinib is. Most patients with polycythemia vera do well. Uh, the control or the goal of therapy is to minimize the risk of thrombosis, reduce the risk of cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease. There are those patients who continue to have constitutional symptoms. And the patients that, at least I find in my clinical practice that are most troubling to manage, are patients who develop and complain of night sweats, fevers, pruritus. They can be very difficult to manage, specifically pruritus. Hydroxyurea is not really effective in this, uh, this case. Phlebotomy sometimes makes it worse. And so these are the patients that I'll initiate uh, ruxolitinib therapy. The other patients that I, I tend to initiate ruxolitinib therapy are those patients who have clear toxicity or side effects from the hydroxyurea. And two are important. One is lower extremity ulcers, and the second is recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Both are known risk factors for hydroxyurea therapy. When these develop, I stop the hydroxyurea and switch to ruxolitinib. Recently, I took care of a patient with polycythemia vera that was diagnosed three or four years ago, uh, well-controlled uh, hematocrit on phlebotomy and hydroxyurea, uh, with hydroxyurea dosing in the 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams per day range, but really good control of her uh, disease uh, counts. However, uh, I started noticing that the patient was complaining of progressive fatigue, insomnia due to horrible pruritus, mostly aquagenic pruritus, that is pruritus exacerbated by water exposure, but to the point that she was having difficulty bathing at night and, and just having the sheets uh, on her uh, were having troubles, uh, and then, you know, horrible night sweats. And so for this patient, I initiated ruxolitinib, and within two to three weeks, night sweats went away, her pruritus resolved, her fatigue improved, she was sleeping better, and it was a, a transformative event in terms of her quality of life. So that's an example of a patient, although having good control of the hematocrit with best available therapy, we were losing control of her symptoms. Uh, and this was uh, maintained or uh, being able to achieve uh, with the initiation of ruxolitinib. Patients with polycythemia vera who are treated with ruxolitinib uh, can have complications. Uh, one of those that has been uh, seen as a rare increase or low increase in the risk of uh, zoster or shingles. Other uh, infections have also been noted to be increased and those need to be monitored. In general, I find ruxolin to be well controlled, uh, well tolerated, uh, and you know the only reason that I discontinue therapy with ruxolindib are when an infection develops or uh, in a patient who seems to be losing disease response with a rapidly uh, increasing uh, white count, or I'm not able to achieve control of the hematocrit. Having said that, in my experience, that's a rare development. The treatment of polycythemia vera is to reduce the risk of thrombosis and cardiovascular toxicity, and that can be done with uh, 
phlebotomy, low-dose aspirin. Uh, it's unclear where and when the initiation of JAK2 inhibition, specifically ruxolitinib, should take place. Clearly for patients who cannot tolerate hydroxyurea, clearly for patients who are, for whom the hydroxyurea is ineffective in controlling the hematocrit, those are clear indications to switch therapy. But what about patients earlier in the disease course? I think that's a big unknown. Uh, the study that's been done so far uh, was taking patients who were refractory to hydroxyurea in both symptom and disease control. Uh, th the new studies are going to need to be uh, uh, asking the question, can ruxolina be moved earlier in the disease center in terms of a disease modifi modifying agent? How would that be assessed? Uh, reduction in the risk of thrombosis, cardiovascular toxicity, cerebrovascular toxicity, and maybe decreased risk of transformation to myelofibrosis and or leukemia. But this is an unknown at this point.